We humans live with nature and we depend on nature, but we often interfere in its processes, sometimes in a destructive way and sometimes in a way that makes things better for the environment. Today, we'll show you a range of interesting examples. Welcome to Eco Africa. I'm Neo Taigbe in Lagos, Nigeria. Among today's stories, invasive water hyacinths and how they are being put to good use in Ghana. And we shed a light on a new trend around e-mobility in Africa and Europe. In Egypt, the Bedouins are returning to a more sustainable life due to the pandemic. Stay tuned. We start the show focusing on the future of mobility. Lots and lots of people get right on motorbike taxis. In many countries across Africa, like Nigeria, they are the number one means of transport, especially in places like Lagos, but they are dirty. And that's why in the Ugandan capital, Kampala, the plan is to switch to electric motors, and not just for the motorbikes, but all kinds of vehicles, especially since more and more people finally realize that transportation needs to become more eco-friendly and sustainable. Francis is one of the few people in Uganda driving an electric motorbike. He sees a lot of advantages to it. Number one, it is silent. Number two, it doesn't consume fuel at all. Number three, via, via hills, it climbs very well. Okia's food delivery is being eagerly awaited by a pregnant customer. Since he saves on fuel, he can charge less than his competitors. He's actually very cheap, cheaper than any other border guys. I think uh, they do, the other people double their price. So literally it has been convenient for me. In Kampala alone, there are about 130,000 motorcycles or border borders. The masses of motorized vehicles generate a huge amount of air pollution. That is why the United Nations Environment Programme provides advice and financial support for electric mobility in Eastern Africa. We need intermediary responses, we need intermediary interventions, and electric mobility is one of those because it is easier to adopt, requires little infrastructure, they emit, they don't emit, so you can have a complete switchover and go on a low carbon development path. That path requires pioneers like Ben Lokeris Koryang and Jacob Hornbach. The graduates of Aachen University in Germany had a pragmatic idea take the already existing fuel motorbikes in Kampala and transform them into electric bikes. So, all we remove is what you call the petrol powertrain, petrol driven powertrain, and we put an electric. Powertrain. So as you can see, it's the same bike. Uh, fuel tank is empty, of course. Um, and what we put inside is mainly a controller, an electric controller, an electric motor, a battery as a source of power, replacing the fuel tank, and some digital controls and a throttle. Lithium-ion batteries recovered from old laptops are assembled into rechargeable battery units for the e-bike and the recycling loop continues, even when the batteries become too weak to use in the e-bikes. So what we do is get the newer batteries, use it for e-mobility. After that, when they lose a bit of power, we either put it, we put it in storage systems, you know, like power banks, you know, or power reserves. And once it loses again, you know, loses a bit of power, we, we go to torches and other smaller applications before it goes to, to, to be disposed. Delivery man Francis Okia is one of the 20 drivers testing the transformed bikes. On average, he has to return to Borderwork twice a day to recharge. He rents the batteries for the equivalent of less than 3 euros a day. All in all, this has cut his operating costs by half. This rider is German engineer Daniel Dreher. He had worked for a solar energy company for several years 
before he decided to try to make Kampala's motorbikes cleaner. With his startup Zimbo, he now imports cutting edge electric motorbikes from China. Each one sells for about a thousand euros. That's quite a bit of money. But the drivers can pay over a period of two years. And the e-bikes are tailored to their specific needs here. Our driving mode is different than a Chinese person commuting to work. Here we really look into productive use and hundreds of kilometers every day. For a small fee of just over half a euro, a Zimbo driver can exchange an empty battery for a fully charged one. The Zimbo e-bikes are fully green since the electricity comes from the solar energy array on top of the company's building. This green technology behind Francis Okia's deliveries is a sign of hope in two ways. Providing for people's needs in the lockdown and for a cleaner country once the pandemic is over. Good ideas, but the question arises, what will mobility look like in the future? This is an increasingly important question for large metropolitan areas. In Europe, emission-free electrical solutions are becoming more popular, and this also includes a new generation of the so-called tiny cars. They are small, colorful, and as easy to charge as a smartphone. The vehicles, which compete with bicycles and scooters, may one day become the sustainable means of transport in cities. These tiny, fun-looking, lightweight vehicles are the future of e-mobility, costing as little as 6,000 euros. And they're as easy to charge as a smartphone. Just connect them to your home's power socket for three hours and you're ready to roll. This is really exciting. The idea is that we need electric vehicles that work for the masses. If you really want to be eco-friendly, you need to think from a point of, hey, how much car do I really need? What type of vehicle do I really need? Do I really need a car? There is an environmental conscience emerging, not only the regulatory environment, the young generation, the people who live around us. But it doesn't mean that mobility should be restricted. French car maker Citroën is the first manufacturer to mass produce an electric two-seater. The Army weighs in at only 550 kilos and is limited to a top speed of 45 kilometers an hour. That means in some European countries, even 14-year-olds could get behind the wheel. Army 100% electric is going to be in competition with electric bicycles electric moped or electric scooter. That's a new generation of urban electric mobility solutions. AMI is a statement and brings you back this freedom of individual mobility. Cheap, compact cars were very much en vogue in the 1950s. In Germany, the tough post-war years made the tiny BMW iZ and Messerschmitt Kabinenroller a hit with buyers. But after Germany's economic recovery, many people switched back to bigger cars. In the quest to develop more energy efficient vehicles, microcars have undergone a renaissance. The electric Microlino, developed by two Swiss brothers, is clearly inspired by BMW's 1950s iZ. We were amazed by those concepts because they were they were so interesting and so I mean so actual, and that's kind of like for us when when we said like okay it needs to be small and uh, and simple like that uh, bubble cars from the 50s. Paul Leibold is a microcar pioneer. In 2013, the German engineer assembled a team of tech experts to build a lightweight three-seater, and they succeeded. At less than 550 kilos, this electric compact car really is something. 
ist. Aber ich bin der Typ, der die großen I'm the kind of guy who likes finding solutions to big challenges. That fulfills me. The future will be all about cooperation, I'm sure. We want to launch a bubbly, energy-efficient car. We've already got enough large, aggressive, super-fast cars on our streets. Citroën even lets buyers customize the look of their electric compact cars. It's really simple. And Leibold's ACM can easily be made to fit a fair bit of cargo. And it doubles as a taxi too. The plan is to mass-produce these vehicles in Asia. That's where Paul Leibold initially drew inspiration for his compact car idea. Of course we drove around in tuk-tuks. That was incredibly fun. We were driving around in these minimalist vehicles without windows, feeling the wind and experiencing everything much more vividly. That changed my view on getting around cities. Small vehicles can be even more fun than really big ones when you're driving around city centers. Will compact cars catch on once they hit the market and help make electric vehicles mainstream? Only time will tell. It's interesting to see how we respond as human beings to the circumstances of our lives in order to change things. Now from e-mobility we go to fashion. A young designer in Mozambique decided to stop using chemical dyes and to make her own organic ones from plants harvested by women locally. The result? Eco-friendly and socially responsible fashion that also looks great. Let's see this. This top is made of recycled capulanas, a sarong worn in Mozambique. Mozambican fashion designer Rekansia Ajira has created handcrafted pieces using sustainable methods. After the oil industry, the textile industry is considered one of the world's biggest environmental polluters. But Rekansia's Afro Ricky brand has taken a much more eco friendly approach. Decancia says the prices for her artisanal clothing are fair in order to properly pay all the workers in the production chain. The corona pandemic has meant her internet sales have grown, but clients can still visit her atelier in Maputo by appointment. Africa can contribute Africa can make an important contribution through its rich biodiversity. We have several species of roots and plants which provide us with natural dyes. This can offer a great solution for the future. We can practice natural dyeing as a way of reducing the environmental impacts of the textiles industry. Rekansia believes that by offering sustainable solutions, Africa can revolutionize the fashion industry. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Our next report is about letting nature rejuvenate without human intervention, or at least not too much of it. In the Netherlands, people recently created five new islands in the Warden Sea. The archipelago, not far from Amsterdam, which can only be reached by boat, is now a paradise for tourists and nature lovers. Let's see this. 60 kilometers from Amsterdam on a tourist boat. The destination is one that only recently appeared on the map. Five islands in an enclosed sea or lake, created out of nothing in four years, called Marka Wadden. In 1976, the construction of a dam sealed off this portion of the North Sea, which became like a vast pond with no water inlet or outlet, muddy and stagnant. Marka Wadden was made because of getting rid of the suffocating blanket, the slick. 
uh, we make some aisles and we filled them with the soil that's causing the problem. One of the islands is now open to the public. It has a functioning harbour for several private visiting vessels, a visitor's centre, a beach and five houses that can be rented out for a week. A few years later, four years ago, there wasn't anything right here. There was just water, so all the reed, all the slick, all the buildings, the sand dams, etc. was just like what we see at the other side, just plain water. Visitors are attracted by the remoteness of the place, although it's only an hour away from the mainland. Natur Monumenten is one of the Dutch NGOs behind the project. As soon as the silt and sand was pumped from the bottom of the sea to form five roughly shaped mounds, the water and wind continued the shaping of the new land. At first, reeds and grasses were planted to retain the sand dunes, but soon nature took over, covering all with a blanket of flowers and plants. At the latest count, some 120 species of birds have arrived, including geese, gulls, cormorants, and more than 2,200 nesting common terns. Lisbeth Bakker is researching zooplankton, whose presence plays a key role for marine life. I'm taking the oxygen uh, level of the water layer, as well as the temperature. And one of the interesting things you see of his Markavada is, is made of the sediment of Lake Markamir. And Lake Markamir is originally it was a sea, so it's marine sediment. And that means the the mineral content of the of the water can be really high because the probably the sediments are still uh, giving some salt. The new addition to the Dutch coastline is a paradise for birds, fish and tourists alike. But not everyone is happy with the new arrangement. About 20 kilometers to the north, fishermen in the town of Uck say declaring the area a nature reserve has deprived them of the whole Markermeer Lake in one stroke. We don't have a problem with the Markervaden. We love nature too, because we're nature people. But we made all these investments and suddenly they cut our legs. We had 450 nets and now we can only use 15%. So then we tried to go outside to the North Sea. We adapted two boats for that, but really they're too small. We tried for years to go out there in spring to get back on our feet. In the struggle to allocate land and sea in the densely populated Netherlands, nature has won this time. The fish have returned to the Markermeer Lake, and for once, they're only being hunted by the birds. When people intervene in nature, things can also go very wrong. The water hyacinth is an aquatic plant from the Amazon in South America that came to Africa a century or more ago. The invasive species grows and spreads incredibly fast and has significant negative impacts on the ecosystem. For instance, it clogs rivers and lakes and deprives water of oxygen. A woman's cooperative in Ghana has developed a profitable way to fight back. It's harvest time on the Volta River in southern Ghana. These women work for the initiative Global Mamas and are gathering water hyacinths near the town of Akuse. It's a common plant in the region. Global Mamas process the stems into a natural fiber. Florence Atsi Zokbe now has a reliable income. We have it here, but we don't know use of it. So when Global Mamas came, they came and teach her how we use it. And now we are harvesting it and be selling to them. So after selling it, we get money from them to, to support our family. More than 30 local women process several tons of water hyacinths a month. The plants are invasive and highly problematic, especially for fishermen. Here on Lake Victoria, its dense foliage creates a sort of floating mat that makes it hard for boats to move through the water. The fisherman catch has fallen dramatically. 
In Potsdam in Germany, Michael Bockhardt has spent years researching invasive species like water hyacinths and studying their impact on the water ecosystem. When most of the sunlight is absorbed on the surface, then much less reaches into depths. That leads to a big reduction in algae growth, so there are no available nutrients at the very start of the food chain. There are no water hyacinths on display here because they are no longer allowed to be grown in the European Union. In Africa, where they've expanded massively, efforts are underway to find new solutions to combat the invasive species. There are two types of weevil that eat water hyacinths and breed on their leaves, so they were introduced in problem areas in Africa as a way of reducing the plant's spread. But before you do something like that, you have to be absolutely sure that they won't decide that they prefer other African aquatic plants to water hyacinths and start eating them instead. In most regions, the plants still have to be harvested manually, ideally before their growth has spiraled out of control. Global mamas only process a fraction of the water hyacinths harvested from the Volta River, but at least they have found a constructive use for this invasive and highly challenging species. The pandemic has hit the Bedouins in Egypt very hard, since many of them worked in the tourism industry as guides or in hotels and resorts on the Red Sea. But then came the coronavirus bringing travel bans and lockdowns. When they lost their jobs, many of them decided to go back to their families and communities in the mountains, often seeing no alternative. The upside to this radical change to their livelihoods, however, is that it is benefiting the environment. In St. Catherine, home of the Jabalia Bedouin, COVID-19 has brought tourism to a complete halt. Those working in the industry have been left without income. Many Jabalia have returned to a more traditional way of life. Some have gardens that are a thousand years old. Sayed Musa Muhammad has revived his family garden to grow food. Here in St. Catherine, a lot of the Jabalia, about 50 or 60 percent, work in tourism. There's no other job or income at the end of the month. So we've started to live the way our fathers and grandfathers did, which is to live from your garden. He grows various vegetables. He also has some grafted trees, a technique used widely here. This is a grafted tree. It was a bitter almond tree and we grafted a plum tree onto it. It's doing well. Tending to fruit trees is a long-standing tradition amongst the Jabalia Bedouin. Hakim Ahmed Mansu Diguni owns one of the oldest gardens in the area and has been tending to it for decades. He's been encouraging other Bedouins to return to their roots. Whatever we do in the civilized world will not suit us. Our nature isn't civilized. Our nature is Bedouin. The main challenge the Bedouin face in their gardening is the lack of rain. It's August, the hottest time of the year. Water is scarce. This year, winter rains filled up the granite aquifer, but that isn't always the case. The people here have to adapt to the water shortages. What grows most here are almonds and pomegranate, because they tolerate drought. The water we use is rainwater from the wells. Sometimes there's rain, sometimes there's none. The altitude and weather create an ideal microclimate for growing trees and vegetables, an advantage over other regions in Egypt. In drought periods, when the wells don't provide enough irrigation water, the Bedouin irrigates from wells high in the mountains. Mahmoud Mansou Diguni a Bedouin elder with a vast knowledge of plants and trees is happy that people have returned to their gardens. If they grow some fruit trees and some vegetables, like tomatoes, zucchinis, plus other greens, and have some livestock so they can get a bit of milk, they don't need anything else from outside. He grows pistachios and almonds. These provide him with a cash crop to generate income.
Pistachios are expensive. A pistachio tree can yield 15 to 20 kilos, so that's good money. Almonds are expensive too. Nuts fetch good money, and they grow especially well here in St. Catherine. Owning livestock, growing food, and keeping fruit orchards is part of the Jabalia way of life. Now, in these changed circumstances, falling back on this traditional lifestyle is proven to be a lifesaver. When protecting the environment also promises financial benefits, people are more likely to get involved. That is one takeaway from that story, and it is an issue we often look at on Eco Africa. If you don't want to wait a whole week until our next show, visit us on our social media platforms or follow us on Twitter or Instagram. That's all for today. Goodbye from me, Nail Tag. We're at the Lufasi Park in Lagos, Nigeria. No, oh, oh, oh.